Atiku vows to end banditry and revive dead Kaduna Industries even as thugs disrupt a PDP rally. And Zamfara State Governor shuts down TV and radio stations for broadcasting stories about the opposition. This is Plus Politics. I'm Mary Anako. Atiku Abubakar, the presidential candidate of the People's Democratic Party, PDP, has vowed to revive dead manufacturing industries in Kaduna as well as end banditry, which has plagued the metropolis for years, even as suspected thugs disrupted his campaign rally in the northern Nigerian state. Reacting earlier to reports of an attack on PDP members by suspected APC thugs at the rally, Atiku urged President Buhari to ask all parties to call their supporters and members to order and to ensure that campaigns were kept free, fair and safe. The incident came hours after APC and the PDP supporters clashed at a rally organized by the PDP in Guso, the Zamfara state capital. The mayhem, according to the police, uh, claimed lives of one person and left 18 others injured. Well, joining us to discuss this and more is Dr. Pedro Obasaki. He is a media consultant to former Vice President Atiku Abubakar. It's so good to have you join us, Mr. Obasaki. Oh, thank you very much. I am happy to be finally. <laughs> yeah, great. Um, Let's start by talking about all of the um, build-up to the campaigns and what's happening in the party. But first things first, uh, we cannot but um, ignore, we cannot ignore, you know, the, the issue of the, um, you know, thugs who attacked the PDP rally in Zamfara State. Um, what exactly do you think led to um, that situation? Of course, we also saw uh, your candidates and other presidential candidates in Kaduna State where uh, they played um, guests to the Arawa community. Um, let's talk about that situation first. Uh, principally, I'll say that um, it's a pity that what occurred, actually occurred, is, um, is symptomatic of the security failures of the present APC government. And that is replete all over Nigeria. So I think that the disruptions or the attempted uh, disruptions of the campaign activities in Kedna State and also the the one in Zamfara State is symptomatic of the of the, of, of the failure of the APC. Nigeria is presently almost like a failed nation and we need to rescue Nigeria from the brink. And we, we are not going to expect things like this not to continue to happen. But by the grace of God, we believe that all Nigerians will stand steadfast in the play in the, in the face of this continuous uh, brigandage. I think that the president of the Federal Republic of Nigeria should rise to this level of statesmanship and realize that he came in by defeating a sitting president. Now he is going out. He should let the polity play out. He should allow people, the Nigerian nation, to actually reap the most important dividend of democracy and that is the right to choose our leaders either they be in the Sahel areas of Zamfara or in the marshes or in the forest of the south that is what is needed and the inspector general of police should realize that he must stay above the fray he mustn't be partisan he is a public officer who is meant to defend the commonwealth of the Nigerian peoples, irrespective of their political leaning. Uh, let's talk about, let, let's just backtrack a bit. You said that these things that happened or what transpired in Kaduna and Zamfara are symptomatic of, um, you know, the failure of the APC government. Uh, does this mean that the government was responsible for that? I mean, if there were overzealous members of a particular party, does that mean that the government somewhat had a hand in it? I'm trying to understand what you meant there. If the, if the yeah. If the if the sitting executive governor of a state of one of the states so involved will go to the extreme 
by banning any known APC advertising or by banning the appearances of persons who don't share same political views, it shows that what we are seeing may just be the hand of Esau and the voice of Jacob. Outside of that, on a larger level, we must realize that Nigeria has been faced with monumental security challenges. Outside of the seeming uh, uh, hoodlums who, who try to disrupt political activities in Kaduna State, when I say it is symptomatic, I mean that it actually is a reflection of the overall failure to arrest the insecurity in the Nigerian nation. Mm -hmm. And that is what I mean. So the government, on whose table the book does stop, the government who is saddled with ensuring that there is security of lives and property of persons who dwell or who are citizens of this country, they must take the blame head on. And those, you see, PDP cannot be attacking PDP. PDP cannot be holding a rally and then PDP. It is PDP holding a rally and the sitting failed government decides whether via subterfuge or directly to invade the civil open constituted gathering of persons who are sympathetic to the PDP. That is how it is. I'm just calling the spade exactly its name. So I think that the government and the party in power should rise above the fray and rein in their subordinates and supplicants so that these 2023 general elections will be a watershed for the entire nation of Nigeria. Let's talk about. So I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't. I don't uh, uh, have to take the blame. Okay. I cannot be the victim and the perpetrator. Okay. Uh, let's quickly, before we go into the internal party politics of the PDP, uh, let's talk about the spread of the PDP. Uh, the PDP, of course, had uh, been in power for 16 plus years in Nigeria. And many um, would say that um, Nigerians grew weary of the party and decided, and that's how we had the APC here. But now, again, we have the PDP coming back to ask for the votes of the people. Why should the average Nigerian who sat on the 16 years of, or 18 years of um, the PDP's rule um, want to vote your candidate back into office? What exactly does he have to offer? What has changed between 2015 and now in the person of former yeah. Vice President Atiku Abubakar? And what would he say to us that would convince us to give him our vote? The only thing is just to do is to replay your memory bank. Your own memory bank. And as well as the memory bank of every other Nigerian. As of 2015, the Nigerian nation had become comfortable with politics and democracy. And we felt that maybe the government of good luck Abele Jonathan was not uppity enough. In fact, the only major reason that that government was removed was because the APC then created a lie, banded it into sophist narrative to say that the man was clueless. That was exactly the word they were using. They told us that everything about Nigeria was bad. Many said they were thieves. But in voting in the APC, they told us there was going to be change. APC change. In the second election, they said they were taking us to the next level. But we all know what that is today. That as at the time the military were leaving office, Nigeria was one of the most indebted nations in tropical or in, 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 in uh, sub-Saharan Africa. But by the time the Obasanjo Atiku uh, 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 presidency was standing down, we had paid Nigeria's debt. Nigeria no longer owed anybody. The Paris Club and the London Club and all the IMF and World Bank debts were paid. Nigeria was a booming, thriving, new democracy. By the time we came, the Jonathan government, before they left office, the IMF and the World Bank recalibrated the GDP of African nations. 
and Nigeria became the, the single largest economy in black Africa, in, not just in, in Africa. That is a matter of fact. As at that time, Nigeria had experienced a 25 to 30 naira depreciation of the naira against the dollar. When Obasanjo came into power, the naira was about 150 naira to the dollar. And in 16 years, 16 years, the naira did not fall beyond the 197 naira it was when Jonathan left office. But today, taking into consideration the purchasing power parity of the Nigerian economy. Today, if, if I check correctly, as at this morning on the parallel market, the dollar was 740 naira. All the promises made by the APC failed. In fact, while Nigerians thought they were driving away some thieves, Nigerians, we voted in murderers. We've had more, more deaths of Nigerians unprovoked in a peace time than the entire aggregate deaths of Nigerians during the civil war. Nigeria has more, has become the kidnapping capital of the world. Nigeria has become the most palace, poorest nation in Africa that is not at war. Today, Nigeria, some parts, some swaths of the country don't appear to be under the command of the federal government. Today, we have become more ethnic, more tribal, more divided than we have ever been in our 62 years of existence as, as a nation. In fact, since our amalgam of the amalgamation of Lord Lugard. That is a fact. Today, we have more ethnic jingoists, we have more secessionists, Biafra, Odudua, Midwest, uh, Middle It is all over the place. Today, Nigeria is like a rudderless ship, a ship without a captain. Today, Nigerians don't even actually know how their president looks like. So what we are saying is this. The PDP has the structures. They had a plan, a plan that made Nigeria turned from the pariah state it was prior to the, 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 the exit of the military to become the investment destination in tropical Africa. Today, our the Nigerian Bureau of Statistics, which is actually a federal government parastatal, just released that they are going to be on a year-on-year -year basis, 24 to 25% inflation. That is what the government says. So when Jonathan was leaving office, Nigeria had a debt profile of less than $4 billion. Today, in just seven plus years, we now have $42 trillion. No, I mean, this, there is, let's wake up and smell the coffee. That is the exact problem the Nigerian state faces today. Okay. That is a truism. As much as, uh, you know, you've been able to walk us through some of the ills that society is facing today, um, I asked the question as to why should I vote for you? Yes, I know my problems. What solutions are you offering me? What is this structure that you keep talking about? What is a structure without a play-by-play -play strategy and plan? And, of course, telling me what you're going to do, how you're going to do it, and if I'm convinced enough, I might vote for you, but then I'm, I've not heard it. I'm just hearing a lot of blanket statements. You're telling me what I already know. So again, on behalf of the average voter, who I am also, how do you intend to change these woes into some sort of, you know, um, uhuru, if I might say? Uh, <coughs> uhuru doesn't come easy. I know. A matter of fact. That is why if you are in the public domain, you realize that Atiku Abubaka is the only one so far, up till at least as of last week, when until the Labour Party also brought theirs, in the last in the last few months, his manifesto has been in the public domain. It is a five-point developmental agenda that would take Nigeria from the brink and take Nigeria back. To where Nigeria is meant to be. And that is what we are talking about. The, and it's titled it, My Covenant with Nigerians. And in that, we have a five-point agenda to provide qualitative education because we must understand that the, one of the biggest problems Nigeria faces today is the 
problem of education. Mm. Provide qualitative education because you cannot move a people forward if you don't raise their brain power upward. That is a matter of fact. You cannot change the trajectory of the Nigerian nation without first and foremost changing the, the, the quality of education of Nigerians. We've been faced with the longest ASU strike in living memory. But your, that princi but your principal was once a vice president so, under President Lucia Gorbassanjo. We also had the same situation. I'm not, no, in, I, I'm not in any no, way no, no, holding no. brief. I'm not in any way holding brief for this government. But I do not know what changes have occurred. If ASU in 2023 are asking for the same things that they asked when your principal was a vice president with president uh, under President Lucia Gorbassanjo, what changes have happened? Nothing. So again, um, is this not just trying to give a dog a bad name? What no, what did the, no, the sorry, government sorry. of sorry, President no. Lucia Gorbassanjo no, no. do to change the but education in Nigeria at the time? I mean, I'm guessing that we had more private universities begin to spring up as a result of how bad the public education system was, isn't it? No, that is not true. Really? I am talking now as the former ASU financial secretary. I was right. the ASU financial I was one of those who, I, in fact, I was imprisoned in Gashwa, in present-day Yobe State, from 1994, November, to January 1995, when I wrote that our take-home pay can't take us home, and that my boss was a comedian, and, it, and the wages he pays a joke. Well, most lecturers still have that, those stickers on their walls. But on that, on that level, we must understand that the only time that Nigeria had the least amount of ASU strikes was between 2001 and 2007. Go check it. The rise of private universities was not as a result of a failure in government policy. It was part of the government policy to reduce the involvement of government in education. Please, let's take this easy. I have taught in certain universities outside of this country. And I know that less than 6% of the universities in the United States of America are government-owned. That is the truth. Apart from SUNY in New York, the State University of New York and the City University of New York, all the other universities are private-owned. Oxford is not owned by the British government. Neither is Cambridge. Neither is Albany. Neither is, is Glasgow University, uh, Caledonia University. None. So that is why it is. And I can tell you, that when the first university license was given to the Ignatian University, it was during the military era. It was as a result of the, of the need to privatize the system. That is that for, for that. So I said, you, what are we going to do differently? I have, I have a five-point agenda. And the one is provide qualitative education. And like I said, you cannot move the people forward if you don't move their brain power upward. Next is to get a restructure restructure the Nigerian polity so as to foster unity and stability. Nigeria is the only, for the last six to seven years of this government, Nigerians have been screaming for the restructuring of this nation. And that led in, the, to, in 2014 to the convocation of the CONFAB, of, of, the, of, the, of the National CONFAB, of the Conference on the, on, on, on the Devolution of Powers. That is key, so that Nigeria will move from a paperweight federal system of government to a proper federal system of government with the proper devolution of powers. And as a, it is not something based on campaign sloganeering because in 2018, Atikua Ubaka launched the restructuring Nigeria movement. Then we have to build a dynamic economy for prosperity and the pillars for doing that so as to move Nigeria from a consumer economy to a, producing, to, to a producing economy. Because in normal, small level economics, it is very simple. When your situation is demand driven, prices go up. When it is supply driven, prices come down. Let me give you a very simple example. In, 20, in, in the run up to the 2019 general elections, Article told Nigerians that for us to move forward, there must be a, a, a privatization of the oil sector. Because even all the giant oil companies, including the Brazilian oil company, Aramco in Saudi Arabia, in spite of the fact that these are dictatorships, monarchical dictatorships in South Africa, 
it is privatized. It is actually listed in the New York Stock Exchange and in the in the in the in the in the, in the FTSE in in London. Nigerians cried and screamed because we knew the man was not just a, a Nostradamus. He knew we would get here. And only a few weeks ago, a few months ago, the Nigerian government had to do a vote of a, a vote to pass. And that is that reversal had not turned today NMPC to NMPC Limited. But the only difference is it has been done and shrouded in mystery with in, 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 in mystery with Nigerians don't know the how the shares of the, the shares of that company has been has been uh, uh, calibrated and, and, and devolved. Those are key. Article also knows and he has sworn to ensure security, safety and security of life and property in Nigeria. That is our fourth plank. And then the restoration of our unity in diversity. I am not in my 40s. I'm in my 50s. I'm, in, I'm actually 55 now. And growing up, the anthem I grew up with was Nigeria we hail thee, our own dear native land. Though our tribes and our tongues may differ, in brotherhood we stand. Today, that brotherhood has been torn to shreds. And what the man is saying is, I want to be the bridge. I am the bridge across the Niger. No one, but nobody comes from three, four, five places at the same time. But there must be someone who understands the pains, who understands the 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 special interest across board, across all the six geopolitical zones. So long as you are a Nigerian, in spite of your ethnicity and in spite of your orientation, that those are the five pillars of upon which the PDP in 2023 will love to build this country. And it's available. You can Google it. My okay. covenant with Nigerians. If you want me to take, send it to you after this program, I will send you a soft copy. All right. It is not something that... Oh, you, you've seen it? Yes. I, I, I'd like to probe some of the things that you've said. Please. Um, yes. yes. Just imagine that you're educating us. Um, I, yes. I'd leave the issue of privatization and, and move on to the issue of unifying Nigeria, because as we speak, uh, pundits have said that um, what Nigeria needs is a unifier, first and foremost, before we're able to get to other aspects of, you know, building the nation. Um, in terms of unifying, I'd like to take you back to the issue of Deborah, who was, um, you know, killed uh, somewhere in the north uh, because of, you know, um, some imbroglio in a, a WhatsApp message. Of course, she was in a, a textury um, institution. Yeah, yeah, Do you remember the yeah. tweet that your principal yeah. put out and then it was deleted yeah. again? This back to Rao. Yes. I'm talk we're talking unity here. How does that unify yeah. people? Let's not forget that Nigeria is divided across religious and, of course, ethnic lines. Again, he did make a statement recently about the fact that as a Northerner, Northerners should look to him first um, in terms of picking a leader. Um, especially at a time like this when Nigeria is very, very uh, sensitive and, and we're touchy about subjects like that. Uh, knowing that most people have also queried, um, you know, some of these candidates and how the campaign's strategies have been, you know, taking shape. Most have queried the fact that these candidates seem to be more original. How much of a unifier is your principle if most of the things he's done seems to... Uh, it seems to portray him in a light that he's taken a position which is somewhat of an, um, you know, a bias. All right. I, you know, th that was a three-pronged question. So, so I will split them one after the other. Number one, Deborah. Deborah, I also, you showed my movement, of which I'm the president, the P Midwest People's Movement. We had a position and we tweet and we wrote based on the murder, the gruesome murder of that young lady. Unfortunately, all the presidential candidates, not one, not one mentioned Deborah. Not one. The article problem was article Twitter handle had denunciated and condemned the gruesome murder of that young Why lady. Why was the tweet taken down? Why was the tweet no, taken oh, down? If you no, take, took a position on something, so why I'm didn't he stay? I'm begging you to let me answer. I don't answer a question, ba ba ba. That would make me a, a bole kaja talker. I like to be historiological, so that would be logical, you know. So the man took it down. Pause a minute. Just pause. 
many people from a section of the country actually screamed why should the presidential candidate take sides when even the government the sitting government had not even said or done anything number two the man said he did not like the tonality of the tweet that was put out and he was bold enough to come out in truth and said i told them to take it down because i didn't approve of the lexicon used in that tweet why then the thing went out of cosmic control no seriously why wasn't he, now, why didn't me, he put out the one yes. that he preferred a tone because again if you are you are asking for us to vote for you to lead us you know how divided we, yeah. are, we are in this country in terms of those kinds of yeah. issues and then when a, a murder happens you you have to whoever you are outrightly or shouldn't you let me ask it as a question shouldn't you outrightly condemn the the killing or whatever on whatever basis you should not be excused it's a crime to kill somebody for whatever reason so why couldn't he have at least put out another tweet and say well this i didn't like that but this is the tweet that i wanted to put out initially all of that was not done so telling me that oh i didn't approve of the tweet well what's the one you approved of and how can we tell that you will be, you know, stern when it comes to issues like this, when and if you become a leader? Okay, so I be Bini man, so I go speak, I go speak my, I go explain that in my own small way. Bini man say, you see me they kill who, who pound bad by the India. What about the man who not pound at, uh, pound at all? Uh, kill him, in pound I'm not good rich. What about the man who you not even try pound? It's a zero-sum game. So for me, I wasn't the advisor then. I actually took a very strong position because I believe, as Franz Fanon says, so when you sit on the fence, life will pass you by on both sides. But you see, as at that time, I understood the pressures he must have faced. That is just the truth. And I thank God that behind the sanctuary of locked doors, things have been made to assuage the, the, the families and those who must have fed bad. He, came up and said he was sorry. But my own grouse is, yes, he was sorry, but no other person was brave enough at all to even mention the woman. Okay. Is that, I just want to say, please, that is what the situation, uh, that is exactly what it was. So I, I think that it is important for us to see that when you are in the public domain, they are setting since both centripetal and centrifugal forces that you have to stay so as to manage okay. the expectations. He had uh, heart and belief, and I want that to be put on record. Mr. Basaki, unfortunately, time is not on our side, but I want to say it's a pleasure talking with you. Uh, hopefully, we will have you live in the studio sometime soon to continue to have conversations around the campaign. Thank you the way so much. You ask your, your Thank you. God bless you. All right. Pedro Abasaki is the media consultant to the PDP's presidential candidate, Atiku Abubakar. So good to have you on the program. Well, we'll take a quick break. When we come back, we'll be talking about the shutting down of media houses in Zamfara State by the government. And of course, what the law has to say about this. We'll be right back.